Welcome, everybody, to the Living Your Career show. My name is Roisin Duffy, Director of Blue Sky Careers. To every job seeker and to every advancing professional out there, this show is specially for you. And our guests are here to give you their wisdom, and their tools, and their tips. We want to give you the confidence so that you can build your career and take your career according to your aims and your aspirations. Our theme today is all roads to effective career management lead to knowing your personal why. And our special guest is Rail Bricker. And personal why is a phrase that Rail has coined. Rail is a culture futurist. He is a business excellence international speaker. He is the first inspirationist in Australia with Integris Group or Integris Global. And he's a mentor on Mentored with Mark Boris and Mastermind Space. He is a co-host of the Business Excellence Podcast. And our particular theme today, he is the author of Dive In, Lessons Learned Since Business School. I'd like to welcome you to the show today, Rail. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rosine. I think it's important to know a little bit more about Rail, actually. He's an interesting man. Rail is a self-made entrepreneur. He's a business excellence coach. He has a career that spans 30 years, um, two continents Rail, startups, listed companies, venture capital, um, and he runs his own financial services company in Perth. Um, he has a global insight into cultures that many wouldn't have. He has conducted something like, am I right in saying Rail? 85, more than 80, 85. 87 now. I've done two more since I published the, the bio. 87 interviews so far. So those interviews were with companies in 25 different countries, folks. And also they were looking at the culture of those companies and also looking at the future of work. And what, make Ra what makes Rail very interesting to me is that he has a very simple view. He thinks you need to dive in. He said, you know, careers are like businesses and they don't have to be complicated rail. You need to make decisions. You need to see where all the facts are pointing and simply dive in and adjust course as necessary. Um, so I think that's probably a fair assessment, isn't it? Correct. It is. It's about not being tied to a path for our whole lives. It's about, about adjusting when necessary. You know, some people are happy doing the same thing for 25 years and others will go after two or three years. I need something more. I need to adjust it. And maybe we spoke about their personal why. Their personal why is moving and that's okay. Those things have to move. And so when your why moves, so maybe you have to and take a, a 180 degree career shift or a five degree career shift. Those are the things that are going to make us happy and, and really fulfill our why. And when, we feel fulfilled, we're better in the work environment. We're actually more productive, better contributors to the environment and better at work and better at home because we enjoy what we do for eight hours of the day. You're an interesting one because I remember I read your book and I listened to your podcast and that personal why resonated very strongly with me. Why do we do anything? Why do we study what we study at university? Why do we, when we leave university, choose to work in certain jobs or hope that we get um, opportunities in certain companies? But you kind of threw that whole sort of path straight out the window because you were an engineer. Um, you were working for Anglo-American in South Africa. Six months, I think in control systems, well-paid job. And you had done some work experience while you were studying. And then you thought, this isn't for me. And after six months, you went off and you did an MBA while simultaneously doing a Master of Software Engineering. Most people that I know would think that's pretty brave. Most people that I know would say you need to get some life experience, some work experience before you do an MBA. I often say to people, don't race after MBAs. Get some work experience and life experience behind you. Maybe you can tell our viewers and our listeners what would make someone with six months real experience postgraduate go and jump off to do an MBA? Okay, so I'm going to put that into a context. I spent 18 months working underground and then I moved to head office um, so, and I spent six months there before doing the MBA. 
So I had a I had a two year commitment because of my scholarship. But when people ask me today, why did I change out of engineering? My answer is that engineering taught me how to think. And I, when I worked on the mine, I was incredibly frustrated at times because I wanted to understand, it was my own nature, my own why. I wanted to understand this big picture. I wanted to understand how did I fit in as an engineer into what the ultimate product, which was getting the gold out the ground and selling gold bars or um, uranium, which was, you know, um, but, but those were the two products we were producing. And so I wanted to understand my role in that. I wasn't happy just getting to work, doing my job and going home. I wanted to understand the path, the career path, because the career path was, was, was almost a little bit like the military. It was fairly rigidly defined and it didn't allow space for entrepreneurship in the organization. It didn't allow space for creativity. And that was frustrating me. I went to an MBA for two reasons. One is because I had observed all these problems in the corporation. I'd observed this, the, the corporation being so static and still. And, and people, you know, I, I, a funny story was I got to head office and the only free office was one in the corner. So I got a corner office at, at, at the age of 24. And, um, you know, people looked at me like, what did you do to get the corner office? And I said, I arrived here and was the only office free. It wasn't that it was my ambition to be in the corner office because I didn't even think at that level of corporate politics. But I went to do the MBA because I understood inherently that the MBA would teach me a lot about a lot of things but no detail on any one thing. And people think the MBA is going to make them managers, make them leaders. No, it isn't. But what it's going to do for me as an engineer, I knew numbers. I knew how to think in numbers. It taught me about human resources. It taught me about negotiation. It taught me about economics. It taught me about accounting. It taught me about skills that I've put into my businesses for 30 years but it didn't really make me an expert in any of them. And that's where I think the downfall is of the MBA program today, is it still markets itself as making you an expert. It doesn't make you an expert. That's why my book is called Lessons Learned Since Business School. How did I apply what I learned there about this broad range of business to you know, so so the same as any person graduating university today, they graduate as an accountant. They don't understand human resources. You know, the 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 person, the doctor going into the hospital doesn't understand how to manage staff. Um, the doctor doesn't understand how to do accounting. So the MBA gave me that broad sense of not being an expert in anything, but knowing enough that I can employ experts and understand what they're talking about. Mm. So that's why I think the MBA is brilliant. I had two years of experience. I was probably just at the cusp of having just done an, enough to get by on my two years experience. I wasn't the 30 plus year old with eight or 10 years experience. And that probably diminished the value of the MBA. Hmm. But I think I'm an obs I observe people and I observe organizations. And so I think I was able to play that off. I'd been working in a variety of jobs since the age of 14. So I'd really been in the workforce on and off for 10 years, um, not in a full-time role except for those two. So, yeah, I was probably a little bit young, but I knew that I wanted to know about the organization and how all the machine pieces fit together to make it work. I think what you're saying, Rael, is that MBAs have value. They don't Absolutely. make you an expert but they give you a diversity of skills that you won't learn in a specialist master or, a, or an undergraduate. It's interesting to me because you then obviously set up your own education business and that was very successful. And you went into venture capital and of course you run your own financial services business in Western Australia. My question was most people who go into venture capital or any sort of financial services, I mean, I know you run your own show now, but usually they work for global companies. There's tons of money involved. I mean, it's almost like people would say that is the top of your career to get into venture capital, listing companies, 
stocks and shares, um, you know, uh, yeah, the big end of the financial side. You left it and decided to set up your own financial services venture. So tell me about what made you decide to do that. So two things there. I, I, was, I was very lucky. I'm a networker. So one of yeah. the best career advices I can give to anybody wanting to build a career is to network is to network and so but but uh, and i know you interviewed a very good friend of mine a few weeks ago on your show who, who talks about building relationships and and but one of the things about networking is most networking functions people go there just to sell to sell what they're doing but if you go there with just the intention of building relationships um, you build up incredible relationships with people okay so 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 why is that important so i i had met some people in south africa came to australia in 99 and the people i knew in south africa introduced me to some people in australia i went to have coffee with them and i said here i am what's and all this is what i'm looking to do i'd been in uh, consulting to a venture fund in south africa post the listing and acquisitions of my businesses there and went and had coffee and said, that's it. Sunday afternoon, I was sitting at the beach, so we can do that in Perth because we have nice winter and weather, uh, winter weather most of the time. Sitting not on the beach, but at the beach having a picnic with my kids. My mobile phone rang. It was the guy I'd met on the Friday saying, I may have an opportunity for you. Can I come and fetch you, take you to my friend's house, and let's have a conversation? I didn't know anything about him except my hour-long conversation on the Friday didn't know who his friend was fetched me went to the house I sat there at the house beautiful house in a really expensive suburb and we spent four hours talking about my views on the world and investing in startups and small businesses so I've always understood that my niche is the small medium enterprise can I add value to a BHP or a you know, major corporation? Probably not as much as I can add to the medium enterprise sector. Mm. And so, yeah, so we got talking and they were looking for an investment manager for their fund, which is an $8 million fund, a tiny little fund at the time, um, $8 million fund. They said they're looking for an investment manager and I gambled on myself. I've always backed myself. So I said to them, pay me half my salary for six months and at the end of six months, if I'm still here, pay me back the other half and then put me on full salary. So I was prepared to back myself into it to prove myself. So I joined them. We went and, and, and listed that venture fund on the ASX, raised 20 odd million dollars. Um, met a lot of people because the group that I was with, the other directors, introduced me to all their contacts who I'm still in contact with today. Um, we listed it, and then uh, a couple months later, they asked me to move to Sydney to carry on with the fund. And I made a lifestyle decision that I wanted to stay in Perth. So that was why I left that world um, mm -hmm. of the fund. I went out on my own. I thought, oh, well, yeah, no problem. I'll just find some small clients and help them raise money. And I did that. And then people said, hmm, we, we also need loans. Can you do loans for us? And I, well, yes, I'll find out how to do loans. Because one of my favorite sayings is don't. You know, sometimes admit you don't know, but you know where to find the answer. And that's exactly what I did. I said, yes, I'll find out for you. Found out that I needed to be a finance broker in Western Australia. Um, became a finance broker. And then they said, you did such a good job with our business. Can you help us with our home loan? And there, out of that was born my home loan business. So it wasn't by design necessarily. It started out doing venture capital, but morphed into home loans. And 20 years and $3 billion later of mortgages, it's been quite successful. I think what you're saying is your business has come about because relationship met your talent, met your personal why, and that has come to full fruition in your business. And then your other ventures, you know, consulting, coaching, and so forth. A question, though, you always say, throw caution to the wind, almost. Dive into your career. Adjust courses necessary. And I suppose it's going to be a pretty wild adventure if you do that. But one of the things that you say in your book, you talk about self-confidence, overconfidence, and arrogance. And I'm interested in, I think I get self-confidence. Self-confidence is knowing your subject and speaking to it 
and relate it to the environment where you want to offer value. But then what's, what to you is the difference between overconfidence and arrogance? And perhaps where can you see that as being potentially bad for careers? Well, or a negative, and, I wouldn't say bad, a negative, yeah, an impediment. You know, and, and when I wrote those lines, I actually, honestly, that was me burying my soul because I've always been confident of my own ability. My, my late father, who died 20 odd years ago now, took me to Toastmasters from the age of 14. So I learned a level of confidence of standing up and speaking to people much older than me. I was 14 at a Toastmasters meeting of, you know, adults. And so that confidence has always gone through. The ability growing up in a, in a fairly average sort of lower middle class household, not a lot of money there, but I got to understand that anything I wanted to achieve, I'd have to A, do myself, but B, I believed in myself. That's probably the biggest driver of confidence is self-belief. And so we all suffer from imposter syndrome. And, and when I wrote my book, I suffered from imposter syndrome. I wrote the book and went, oh, no one really wants to read this. So I put it away for two years before I actually sent it to someone else to read it. Because as much confidence as I had, I wasn't confident in the message of the book. So where does overconfidence come in? You know, sometimes we do bite off more than we can chew. Um, we do bite off things. So I went into a business. I bought $50,000 worth of CD covers from Germany. Very clever technology, but I had no idea about the market. Totally overconfident. Just in my own ability, yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll sell them. Just spend $50,000 buying a container load of this stuff. I ended up giving it to somebody who was down and out and needed money. He managed to sell it for $5,000 and I told him to keep the money six years later. So, you know, I, I learned a lot about that. I knew I, overconfidence is not really understanding your own abilities because I knew that my ability was not to sell consumer goods, physical goods. I sell services. That's what I do today. Even the mortgage business is selling services. Arrogance, on the other hand, is is when you start looking down at people who probably aren't as confident as you or aren't as overconfident as you. And you, 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 you display a level of, I don't give a damn. And there have been times in my life where I have suffered from that. Um, but over the years, I think I've matured and tempered the arrogance a lot. You know, and because it's it's not a good trait. Arrogance is not a good trait. No one likes someone who's arrogant. They like confidence when you you know when you stride into a room, displaying confidence. When you stride into a room and don't notice the waiter who's offering you a drink, that's arrogance. That would be the nicest description of it. And I think I've I've taught myself over the last twenty years to temper the arrogance and make it confidence. Does that uh, yeah. make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, again, I'm linking this confidence to personal why. When, you know, acknowledging those around you, being humble around you, being confident is about knowing your stuff. It doesn't mean looking down at people. So yeah. I know, so being overconfident is basically you're saying you can run the danger of backing yourself beyond your capacity and your capability. Arrogance yeah. is not treating people effectively with respect as equals. And self-confidence is having the guts and having the, the insight to know that you can make things happen. It's interesting. You've spoken to, um, I think you said 87 interviews with companies all over the world, I think 25 different countries, and you were a culture futurist. So therefore, you've done a lot of research into business excellence in companies, and the kind of cultures, good cultures, good, bad, and indifferent that run those um, companies. I'm curious to know, in your conversations about cultures, what have, are you seeing as the major changes in their talent campaigns? So in other words, how are cultures changing, and what are the sort of skills do you perceive that they're looking for now when they're looking for really good people to join those companies? 
Um, okay, so a few things have changed. So the traditional workforce, let's call them the, and I hate the terminologies, but call them the Gen Xs or the, the Gen Ys or the baby boomers. They were much more committed to the corporation, good or bad, for extended periods. When we get to our millennials, and I think that's been the biggest change, is that the millennials will live and die for the company that they're working for. They will, they will work 18-hour days, they will, but they want the 18-hour day to start at 9.30 in the morning after their yoga and their chai latte. You know, they want to, and they'll work till 10 o'clock at night and then go out to the pub and have a few drinks and then go to the yoga class and do it all again the next day. That's the millennial culture. And, and I, you know, again, you, the generalizations, but, but from talking to people, they said they've changed the way they look at the team members. They've said, okay, those millennial team members now do their 18 hour days for three years or five years or whatever it is. And then one day they'll wake up and say, I need a change. Not because I don't like this company. I just need to advance. I need another set of experiences. Now, is this driven by the social media? Is it driven by the, you know, Google time, you know, where, where we, we want instantaneous answers? You know, people, traditional companies do annual or maybe six monthly performance reviews. That's the true. millennials want instant gratification and a pat on the back every day about how well they're doing. And so the concept of the culture of the organization is changing to accommodate them. It accommodates them now where we go, we know that they're going to give blood for three to five years and then they're going to leave. I mean, in my own organizations, I, you know, in, in my financial services business, I've had lots of people come and go just because they wanted a new experience. They wanted to do something different. And yet they still pop in here for coffee now and then and say, hey, how are you doing? I see, you know, you're still in your same office and using the same chair. Um, and not that I'm a creature of habit like that, but but the relationships we built up with them was not of one of, oh, you God, you're leaving, so I hate you. And I know lots of bosses who are like that. It, it, the, the culture of the organization of the future is one that says, let's embrace your skills and talent. And when you want to move on, move on. Go and do your thing when you move on because you've given of your best for the company in that period. And they may stay on, you know, there are those who will stay on for 10 and 20 years, but those who want to leave, well, they'll leave, but they've done their best for the company at that point. So basically, mm -hmm. Rael, what we're saying is that companies are factoring in more turnover in their top talent bank. So they're expecting in these generational changes whether it's social media influences, whether it's the it could be global economy, I guess nobody wants to stay in a job that they're not happy in. But it's interesting. So you're saying that there's now that expectation that people are going to move more frequently and companies need to factor that into their training budgets. If they're sponsoring people for MPAs, they need to factor that into their transition, career transition for their top talent, their leadership development programs. Is that what you're saying? There is a spec expectation now with these companies and these cultures that they're going to have people for lesser periods of time. Well, there's, there's a couple aspects to that. The first is that the, we have to design our organizational training and infrastructure to train people for jobs that we don't know exist yet. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's the first challenge we face is, is, is we have to then engage with our workforce and create the opportunities that we don't even, even know where they are yet. So, so that's the first of those challenges. The second is, yes, there may is, so I'm on, I'm on the board of a school and at our board, we were discussing the fact that we go out and recruit some top teachers and they stay with us for three to five years, maybe 10 years, and then they get a promotion to another school. Now, everybody, uh, particularly those people who don't um, appreciate the, the status of the community school, come back and go, oh, yeah, you're losing all your good teachers. Are we saying, no, we're not. 
we've actually recruited the best and now they're getting promoted because there's no longer a career path for them here they're going to sideways step to go upwards that's a feather in our cap because they are loyal they love their job they're just looking for promotion but their boss Advancement. is stuck there yeah absolutely so so that that is part of i think the driver is that people are more ambitious potentially um wanting to move on but i also think that the world is such a people just want different experiences my late father and i quote him a lot my late father always used to say and he unfortunately he died too young he used to say one day when he retires he wants 40 years experience not one year 40 times over um and so that's i think much more prevalent today people don't want one year 40 times over they want every year to be different um, and the accessibility of travel as an example you know when i grew up travel was expensive relative to what we earned today well potentially post coronavirus travel will be relatively cheap compared to what we earn and so the ability for people to travel and experience the world makes them want to experience new things and that extends i think to the workplace you talk in your book about um you know welcoming challenge seeing it as an opportunity to reinvent yourself don't see it as if you can avoid that sort of battle of seeing it as a negative but embrace it and recontextualize and develop yourself i guess i'm interested um and you also talk about positivity in your book you, people you say underestimate positivity it's a kind of something that really captures you i'm thinking about people who are applying for jobs now um i guess how should they if you were looking at applications for your business or perhaps teachers for your school as you've just said and you're you're on various uh, groups and committees and all sorts how would people show you in an application what are the three things you look for when you look for people because we need to be able to relish change now we need to be able to work with change and adversity that's the nature of life and careers now and also from a positivity perspective what are the three things that would stand out on an application to you for somebody that you might want to employ in that school or in your own business or refer to one of your networks well i mean I, again so growing up starting my first businesses and being in corporate you looked at a resume and you thought oh they've changed jobs far too many times okay that was your first negative response now it's actually almost yes if someone's changing jobs every 6 months probably not a you know probably not a stable um opportunity but so i do look at things like have they had multitudes of experiences or are they going to say are they going to be wenwees now in south africa we always spoke about the wenwees who moved to australia because every sentence started with when we were in south africa mm, okay yeah. and so right okay and, and i make south african so i can make jokes about ex south africans okay so so that comparison so you don't want somebody i mean for me i think it's a challenge if somebody's been in a bank and i'm in financial services someone who's worked for a bank 20 years they may have 20 years worth of banking experience would i employ them i wouldn't because i think they would be too much of a when we when we were in the bank this is how we did things and they don't have a an experiential mindset and so somehow looking at people who have gone and gone through a career path at various organizations 2 to 5 years 3 to 5 years i think that's a good trait I think people who've done an undergraduate degree and they've covered subjects like philosophy and 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 African basket weaving because they're good for expanding the mind and obviously they've now narrowed their career as they the the education's grown but I think expanding the mind I think doing weird and wonderful topics I use philosophy as one of those or as I said African basket weaving or or fine art painting when you want to be an engineer or a or an accountant doesn't matter but i think those skills are very useful skills that we need to develop so that's the kind of stuff i look for is not a singular focus because i don't think that 17 and 18 year olds coming out of university can have us as coming out of school 
can have a singular focus on what they want to be doing when they're 30. And so somebody who's got the emotional intelligence to say, let's broaden my mind, let's broaden our understanding, I think that's a much more attractive employee. Um, that's that's from my perspective. That's the people we look for, people who, and then the third thing is, I guess those who have outside interests. So, you want to know if a person plays sport, or walks dogs, or you know raises uh, carrier pigeons, or whatever their hobbies are, because their hobbies dictate to some degree their their downtime you know as an employer you want to know people actually do have downtime they have decompression time but also if somebody says oh i don't have any hobbies then they how do they even integrate with their fellow team members when they have nothing to talk about outside of work because they don't actually have interests i mean in my in my financial services group Every Friday at lunchtime, or most days, we try and sit down for lunch together. But specifically on a Friday, the team buy lunch on my credit card, separate discussion, and um, we sit down and have lunch together. And since the uh, and, and part of the topic is what do we talk about? We talk about everything from you know people's sport to religion. Now you know, say don't talk about religion, but we don't talk about arguing about religion. One of my team members is very involved with a local church. So she tells us about the activities the church are doing to attract the youth, the 25 to 35 year olds to the youth, the, the young adults to the church. To me, that's interesting because it's, it's, it's a different approach. Others will talk about their cultural festivals, you know, um, whatever it may be. And so, but if people don't have any interests outside of work, I don't think they make great employees. I think people need to have outside interests outside. Uh, and outside interests are not necessarily being on social media all the time. Okay. So you know, I think those are the things I look for. Um, I've always listed my sports that I've played and I played at state level on my resume. And I did that, you know, in my 20s. I'm now in my 50s. But I still play sport. I still play competitive hockey. And I use that as a conversation starter because you suddenly discover lots of other people have played hockey at a variety of levels. So those are the three things that I would look at. And I know they're completely outside the square because you're making an assumption. If you've advertised for a job and it says you need a commerce degree in finance, you, that's your base level. You're assuming everyone who's applied has that degree. So you've set your standards. So what sets them apart are those things about themselves. So what we're so saying what we is you have to fit the mold of what we're looking for, but if you can relate your personality, your interests, your experiences in a way that can relate to your environment and to the people who are going to be interviewed, it makes you more human, makes you more real. I think that's what you're saying. So you can be very specialist, you can be very academic, you can be very professional in anything that you do, but you need to bring through those sideline and back stories to make people sort of get a sense of you. And I think that's what I'm hearing from you. Absolutely. You, you, you have to, you know, we use a lot of profiling tools without getting too technical. But the profiling tool that, that we use the most is DISC, which has been around for over 100 years. But it gives you two profiles. It gives you something called an adapted style and a natural style. Now, when we use profiling tools to employ team members, we actually look at and make sure that there are not distinct differences between their adapted style and the natural style. So what do those two mean? I'm getting a bit technical, but this is about living your career. So it's quite important. The, the natural style is how we behave at home and how we behave under stress. So that's our reversion point. When we're under stress, that's what we revert to as a behavior. Your adapted style is how you perceive yourself in the work environment and how you relate to people in the work environment, okay, and how you behave. If there are dis major disparities between your natural and your adapted style, that means you're actually putting on a front at work or you're 
putting on a different persona at work because that's what's expected of you or that's what you expect to do at work. But as soon as you're under stress, you revert to your natural style, which is completely different to your normal style. So when I'm employing, I look for people that have, that maybe they suppress their, their eye, their influence, their dominance, their D and their I. Maybe they suppress those slightly in the work environment, but, you know, you don't want a complete, you know, 180 degree shift in behavioral styles because that's a problem. So, so what you want people to do is be their natural selves in the work environment. But if they're a strong leader outside of work, maybe, you know, tone that down within the work environment, but still shine through, show their personality. I think um, what you're saying is that real person, that natural person is the easiest person to be. So I always talk about the person within that powers the professional. And just in wrapping up rail, what we're saying is self-confidence, um, respect and regard for others, uh, enthusiasm, you know, celebrate your expenses, uh, your experiences, showcase your experiences. Um, and I think the major thing you're saying today is if you put your confidence and your, you know, your motivation, your, your, your passion and your enthusiasm together and you link that with your personal why, which is your motivation, then you're going to go places in your career and nothing is going to stop you. Those are very, very strong forces that will drive you. Absolutely. It is about it is about being confident. I mean, there's no point as an employer employing somebody who goes, well, I'm not really sure that, that I can do that. You know, so there's there's a difference between no confidence, right? Or mm. self-confidence. And so self-confidence actually extends to, yep, I'm pretty sure I can do it. But do you mind if I ask you some questions along the way to make sure I do it properly? That little statement as an, when an employee says to me, yep, I think I know what it is, but do you mind if I'm not sure if I ask you a question? And so that's confidence in your own ability, but confidence in your own ability to understand what you don't know as well. And when you understand what you don't know and you're confident enough to ask the question, that makes the difference as an employer. And, and as an employee, you want that self-confidence, but you don't want the overconfidence. You don't want them saying, yep, I can do that job and going and messing it up. You want them to say, I can do it, but if I have a problem, I'm going to come to you. Rail Bricker, thank you so much. That's 30 years of wisdom, folks. Um, a specialist in business excellence, a culture futurist, um, a man who has worked with a lot of companies, guides and coaches a lot of companies, and has employs a lot of people and understands how that whole effective career management stream works. Rail, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thank you. And to everybody else, our show is back on Thursday at 12 o'clock noon. Um, thank you for tuning in. Um, I, you will most certainly find plenty of substance in today's podcast, so please tune in and listen. And thank you very much, and we'll see you next Thursday. And on that note, goodbye for me and goodbye from Rail. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>